small that is not that uh, that highly populated, so I can get in really quick and just get the damn thing done. I do it every, you know, it just gets to the point where it's bothering me. You know, it's clumpy yeah, and yeah. stuff. Makes sense. I used yeah. to get my, and when I lived in Manhattan, I used to sometimes get my hair cut in Astor Place. It was like uh, just off of NYU, there was a basement that had, I don't know, 25 different hair, hair, you know, barbers sitting there. Right. And, and it was insanely cheap, something like 15 bucks and, rip, 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 and you're out of there. Yeah. yeah. That's about how much it is on, at this place, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> Cool. It looks good. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Anything that doesn't will be gone in a week from now, anyways. Right, right. Exactly. exactly. So I'm I'm in Bucharest at uh this is the inside of a kind of a studio of where they're working stuff. There's an event that's starting right now outside. There they they've taken over. And in fact, re-engineered a pretty big property that the University of Bucharest has. And uh, there's a big house on it, which they've like done magic with. Uh, and then they built fire pits out in the middle of this green and there's walkways and they broke a lot of concrete. Apparently this was a concrete walkway. They broke it up. Like they did serious, serious work here. Um, so I'm going to head Ooh. off to the events, which are starting right now. And Grace has graciously agreed to, to be me or just actually to be her um which that being like the grace jerry confluence being like potentially explosive i don't know could be like <laughs> a thing so i wanted to say uh say howdy and then uh, pass the baton and uh head off as i see we're talking about meta hair and hair club virtual hair club for men <laughs> yeah, right. nice that's right virtual grace, chia uh, pets on your head you know yeah grace the floor is all yours Great. Right. I need to actually you. grab something from my stove in a second, but okay. um, I'm going to start by saying that this is the OGM call for September 29th. That's what this is. And I'm, I'm looking at the um, transcript and hoping it says something funny. So this is our regular check in call. So we don't have a particular topic for today. And uh, Jerry said that he often calls on people in an order that reflects like if they weren't here too too much in the you know last couple of times so that it'll give everybody a turn. But you're all pretty uh, generally. I'm writing down people's names as they come in. You're all people who've been around a, a lot. So um, now I'm like, oh, who should I call on first? It's very com complicated. But I I feel like right in the middle of my screen is Kevin. And I'm always oh. super interested in neighborhoods. So I would I will call on him first. Okay, well, great. Thank you. Um, I've been reporting in that I'm working on uh, a, a neighborhood economics version that is uh, uh, using donut economics uh, as its frame, because it's the only frame I've seen that gets environmentalists and economic justice folks to talk to each other and rather than not talk to each other. I guess that's the simplest way. Uh, a lot of economic justice folks have some problems with environmentalists because of their genocidal history. You know, they like the pristine wilderness. But uh, the thing with the donut is you, you want to be the safe operating space in your local bioregion. And so then it helps, it lets the environmentalists care about everybody in that bioregion. And we're finding that to really be true. And we're meeting at a church that's giving us a, a room for um, the winter and we're putting up our maps. And, uh, and thing, there's about 20 or so people that are showing up now. It's a, a, at least gender diversity. Uh, we're kind of a white part of the county. And they're starting to move toward what they want to be, you know, organizationally. And so they're, they're saying, you know, are we a nonprofit? Are we open source? There's some open source techies involved. There's some folks who want to be the chaotic commons and, and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, when people start talking about governance, uh, I've been around a lot of things like that. I need to have a project that's separate from that because I... I'm sort of uh, just instinctively disruptive to that process. So I've got a thing where there's a local community foundation uh, that it's, it's, it's a donor advised fund for the community really, but it's, it's set at the community foundation. So they give out about 120,000 uh, a year 
and we're starting to do a, a social safety net map because the donut says, what's the social undershoot and what's the environmental overshoot and what's the safe operating space, the donut in between. And so I've come up with some questions that we're going to vote on and add to, but I got about four people who will be working with me on where does that philanthropic money go and what do they see as the need and why are they involved in it? And we'll just sort of know a landscaping of the social safety net, the, you know, the feeding programs, there's a big uh, free diaper kind of thing. And so I, you know, I always need a project that I can focus on while everybody talks about governance and order. So, so I can go in the other room and be working on something. Otherwise, I uh, just toss in firecrackers just as, as you know. So, so I, I, I know that enough about myself that I'm, I'm, I, I need to have this kind of project. And it turns out I got four people who want to help. So anyway, that, that's, it's good to see this thing form. And, and as, as things form in the room, uh, I will, you know, walk out as they do, as they apply order. Cool. I just want to share something quickly with you around voting, because voting tends to be divisive in community, and then I'm going to go to Klaus. But this came up on the recent Gitcoin grants, which was really interesting, because they wanted to share, they wanted to um, create a situation where um, they didn't get scammers and they wanted mm -hmm. to give that authority to the people, um, for anybody who wanted basically. And like, here's just how the screen looks. And it's like, okay, here's this grant and you get to vote. Like here's the team track record and you get to vote from weak to strong, non-rivalrous, weak to strong. Not, obviously you could change these categories. And is this an important problem, weak to strong? And I just want, and this is this is by Othello, as you can see on the top. And so this is an existing system that has been used. There, Othello is around 15 years old um, by communities and nonprofits for a, for a long time now. And then they have like you can whatever they have the, a bunch of different things you can vote on. But instead of a yes or no vote on things, that allows much more of a nuanced like voting system that doesn't end up as divisive as like what we know as voting systems. So I just wanted to point that out to you. Um, yeah, Klaus, thanks. I'm, I'm going to have to specifically be not involved in any of those questions, but I'm sure that's a good thing to think about. Yeah, like one of the things I would really suggest is to not have yes, no votes on anything if you want community cohesion. Yeah, again, um, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be not in that. So thank you, though. All right, Klaus. Yeah, Kevin, are you dialed in on uh, the these new initiatives coming out of Washington? Like yesterday was the focus on hunger and nutrition. In, uh, yeah, I saw that. So that's sponsored by the White House. But at the same time, they're putting massive amounts of money into the U.S. conservation programs. So the Inflation Reduction Program, the IWA, they put mm. $20 billion into the conservation programs. And the challenge right now <clears throat> is, to, is to figure out how at community level you can dial into this. So most mm. everyone <clears throat> doesn't understand the role of the conservationist, right? the Conservation Bureau. The Conservation Bureau was formed under Roosevelt in the 1930s in response to the Dust Bowl and to, to get knowledge, science you know, from a central source to the individual farmers. So there are over 3,000 conservation districts in the US in virtually every county to, mm -hmm. to gain access to this money. So I'm working here in Bend in my community and lo and behold, mm -hmm. two out of four open positions for conservationists don't have anybody running. So mm. people are just not even aware of what this is, right? And how how the government is organized and structured the administrative processes. So I thought that was really uh, 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 an important focal point. Yeah, yeah that's really interesting. I, I will check it out locally. I, I used to, you know, when I was in Mississippi, I knew the county agent, the soil conservation folks really well and all that. But I don't know them here. That's an interesting point. Thank mm. you. Awesome. Doug? Yeah, I just, Kevin, I, um, I'm sort of obsessed with new, new formations, new groups. And one, I love the, your clarity about 
I don't have a horse in that race, so I'm going to create the place I want to go to get started on something while the folks that are enamored of governance like can hash out their governance stuff. And, um, but I was curious whether, you know, foundationally, the whole initiative, the group itself has put any sort of like fundamental stakes in the ground around purpose or around values. Yeah, I mean, we care about the watershed, uh, you know, and so, and, and with the donut, you have a way to look, there's a, you, you can map the social undershoot on, you know, from education to housing, to health, to, to food security. And then on, you know, uh, you know, one of the big things is that uh, the river in Black Mountain, which is the closest town to where I live, uh, has been classed as impaired. And that's impaired because of runoff uh, effluent into it. And so <clears throat> like uh, we're working with a, a local Unitarian church and some folks who know how to do that kind of thing to do a rain garden and, and, and design a swale and a berm and, and, and uh, we're letting them use wood chips and stuff. And so the, the goal uh, on a broad basis is that we, we would collectively respond to climate change in a way that our taxes go down because, because of it being impaired, there's a new fee everybody pays. And they like to call it a fee because it's not a tax, but it's like a tax. And so, but, but the, the story would be if, if we can get everybody to understand rain gardens and uh, things like that, uh, swales and other things, we could be a town that collectively responds to climate change and lowers our taxes. So it's everybody kind of buys into that model as one of the things. And then out of that group of 24 or five are interested in the social safety net. And so we're just going to do a baseline uh, of what's there. And, you know, how many, how many mothers need the diaper service, you know, and how many mothers last year and, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, how many meals are delivered and, and uh, you know, and those sorts of things. Because I think, I think most of the time, philanthropy is really inefficient, you know, but the, the, it, this is kind of a neat thing because it's a community foundation with a sub foundation that is the Black Mountain Foundation. And so it's really a donor advised fund housed at the community foundation so that every, you know, the 120,000 or so is local people giving to the community and then the board of the community found the sub foundation saying where it should go. And I, I bet they don't know much uh, just because mostly they don't, you know, they, they, do, they do things that people, you know, they get pitched by local nonprofits. So we're hoping to uh, see where the gap is between the need and where the money's going. But that's just my assumption that they're not doing it right. Because <laughs> mostly Thanks. they don't. Yep. Awesome. All right. Let's go, Eric Michael Carl. Eric? Hi, everybody. So I've uh, been feeling a sense of acceleration of everybody trying to get back to their pre COVID lifestyles. And um, I, I mean, personally, I'm feeling a lot going on in my life uh, being. You know, with my synagogue, with um, upcoming holidays, with um, a friend in the hospital and whatever. So um, now um, I found an interesting podcast that I'm posting here and I listened to an episode of, with Nora Bateson, which I found very interesting. And uh, there was another one when I found, I found this when I was researching something from Klaus's call that he has on Tuesdays. So, um, yeah, I think she talks about the warm data and how much we don't see when thinking <laughs> or perceiving and uh, just to, to reorient ourselves. So I'm going to leave it at that, uh, just putting out there for people who are interested. Thanks. Great. Yeah, Nate Hagens is um, an ex Wall Street guy who figured out there was something weird going on with this growth economy. And he's an expert in the connection between energy and economy. I think I've posted also from that. I actually did an interview with him for his podcast, and then it was ruined and didn't end up getting on the podcast. And I don't know whether it's because of overwhelm 
or whatever, but he never re-interviewed me and I pinged him a couple of times. I don't know exactly um, what's behind that. I assume he's just overwhelmed with lots of stuff. Um, but it's interesting that you picked the one from Nora Bateson because what I love about that podcast is how grounded it is in reality. So he interviews somebody who's uh, expert in nuclear war. Like, what does that actually look like? Is there such a thing as a limited uh, nuclear war? What would that actually look like? Uh, he, he interviews somebody on material science, like how much material really is there and how many um, batteries could we actually make? And is renewable energy actually going to save us? Uh, one of his recent podcasts, he talks about, he shows some graphs around um, wood. Like, what if we all went back to burning wood in order to heat our homes? Would we, how long would it take before we ran out of forests? And it's very grounded in reality. And he calls it the great simplification because the idea is we're about to be facing a much simpler life. Um, and from <laughs> like people, it's just obvious. I was, somebody was telling me that in France, it looks like they may run out of water like very quickly in some parts of France, like this winter. And um, yeah, and, and so it's, he has some, they're just, he has all kinds, he has a food expert on there one day who talks about, you know, going back to local farming. So yeah, I love that podcast. And Nate is just, I mean, I just happen to have met him in person and he's, he's a great guy. So yeah, so let's go uh, Michael Carl Klaus, Michael. Hello all. Um, see, one one thing that's happening for me is uh, I um, spent spent a big chunk of last week at the other unfinished conference, the pretender to the 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 name that of the conference where longer standing conference where Jerry is um, that Frank McCourt um, is. Uh, the one, the one that I went to in New York was uh, the one that Frank McCourt, former owner of the LA Dodgers, is throwing heaps of money at, um, uh, I think, kind of making himself the anti-big tech um, mogul or something. Um, uh, and it was notable for a lot of smart and well-meaning people being there, um, but not, you know, frustratingly, um, not really coalescing around any particular approach to um, to diffusing the the kind of social media driven problems that you know kind of plague uh information distribution um you know everybody could agree on what was bad but um but everybody you know was proposing a different standard um as to what to do about it um and uh and and frank mccourt was you know touting this new standard that his uh, Liberty Project had developed called, um, uh, let's see, uh, DSMP, um, which was gonna be the Distributed Social Media Protocol, allowing everybody on every social platform to communicate with each other. Um, and uh, so, you know, in the, in the aftermath of that, enlivening but but somewhat discouraging um bunch of conversations um the good part was given its liveness this year um i was able to to meet a bunch of people who i'm following up with and and hoping we can uh do some thoughtful things um yeah that's a big thing going on for me and what and one little note off of um uh what um what came off of of kevin's conversation even though he's not involving himself in it just the whole idea of of uh governance and and voting and decision making i just want to really uh 
respond to the idea of like non yes no and in fact non binary um, decision making and voting and you know um, giving people opportunity to uh, make make you know to do rank choice of statements um, so that you know there there's so many ways in decision making for overlap to be found that a two party system and uh, you know yes no issues just make impossible. Um, I mean, I swear if like people could pull their different strands of thought around abortion apart and say, you know, this really bothers me, but not as much as this bothers me. And this, you know, number of weeks seems, you know, I, I really think that the, the consensus decision would probably basically be the state that was, um, you know, created by Roe v. Wade. Um, but, you know, nobody can see it as something other than uh, a binary call of um, abortion, fine, abortion, murder, you know, um, which is, is not really the, the practical decision to be made. Um, anyway, uh, that's what's up with me. Thanks. It's, it's interesting because the two parts of that conversation come together for me because I'm actually gonna be hosting a Twitter space and Michael, reach out to me if you wanna be in, uh, part of that with a guy from something called, hmm, I can't remember, but it's a it's one of the web-based, um, the web three based privacy chats and some, and uh, Tibet Sprague who's working on Hilo, which is a social network. And I'm gonna bring in Commander Taco as well. Commander Taco has also uh, from Slashdot because the moderation on Slashdot for uh, all of us are old enough to have remembered it if, you know, was brilliant. It was a great, it's a great idea. Instead of like thumbs up, thumbs down, you're, you get moderation capabilities, you get to know who's a troll, you get to know who's a uh, insightful, who's redundant. Like there was these seven things, it's still running today and it's running on some old Drupal platform, but but Commander Taco has agreed to also be in this conversation. And it started when I was talking to this guy from, I can't remember what it is, this privacy preserving um, thing, sessions, I think it's called. And I was saying, look, if you wanna create the new social network or the new um, chat platform, you gotta make it significantly better than what we've got now, which is either completely algorithmically controlled like Twitter and Facebook or completely like just in the order it's done threaded chat that you can never sort through right it's got to be some kind of feed that makes sense to you and if you want people to get on it there has to be something better and so what i was saying is that slash dot was kind of a better moderation and the other thing i said to him is if i were creating a group and i wanted cohesion which is what we were talking about with the yes no voting right and i were creating chat it might have prompts like would you like to say that a little bit differently? Or, you know, this is a more, inf this will give you more influence if you first mention the good parts of their proposal and then mention the bad part. And it's kind of teaching you to converse better. And if I were a community manager, there would be a reason for me to move to a platform like that. Whereas when we see even Hilo and all these stuff, like, it's like, it's not significantly better in a way that says something like, we'll make your community get along better if you move to our social media platform. And so, I mean, interoperability is useful and, 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 and you know, there's always problems. The problems that you've mentioned with interoperability are the same ones. It's like, get a bunch of geeks together and talk about how many, um, you know, how many bytes are in the header and what is gonna, in the order in which you're gonna put the date. And it's like, ah, you know, that could take a year. But, um, I mean, but we were, there is what I was just going to yeah. say. We were we were working on. I met you mentioned Tibet and and Tibet and I are in this group called the Collaborative Technology Alliance. You've been you've been to a a, a session there, and yep. um, and we had a profile schemas group, and honestly, we, we got you know I mean we not that we didn't actually go further, but the sticking point of should 
a name be a single field or two and you know you know people people just get stuck on stuff like that and you never get anywhere um yep. but i also that, just yeah. really want, wanted to respond to what you were saying about about the difference between um an algorithmic feed and you know i think algorithms themselves are are sort of our misnomer for attention deriving primarily ad view driven um things that make a feed sticky things that make a feed supposedly interesting to you but not really interesting and useful as much as sticky and getting you to keep clicking um versus what could also be called an algorithm which which is something that is more than the totally gross uh everything in chronological order without differentiation um the in-between being an algorithm that you create um and and people would be oh i'm, I'm not, i don't know how to write an algorithm but but basically, if you were able to, on a flexible basis, create filters for, you know, now I want to see all stuff that, you know, um, is about this subject that um, Grace made a comment on, you know, I mean, just having the tools to, to at any given moment, create an algorithm without knowing you were creating an algorithm. Um, or I want serendipity right now, and I want to see a bunch of things that are about subjects I don't usually look for, or from sources I don't usually, you know, all those kinds of choices. And that's that's doable um, and yeah. be helpful. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I talk about this, uh, you know, when you buy a larger set of pants, the algorithm just starts selling you larger clothing. It doesn't sell you more nutritional food because it doesn't care. So there's ways to do algorithms that are, yeah, certainly that is part of the, uh, I keep seeing the note, the fathom note taker unmuting itself. I'm like, what the hell is that about? Um, okay. Uh, so let's go Carl, Klaus, Stacy. Carl? Uh, yeah, it's, um, I just spent the past couple of days, there's, uh, uh, group that's been looking at the future of tax and uh, looking at uh, at um, virtual reality uh, type of thing, and then there I found out there's this huge there's a huge group of people that have been really looking at the accessibility of VR environments for people with disabilities. And I've been in, so I'm really intrigued with that and figuring out um, that's my I work at General Service Administration addressing those kind of issues. So it's um it was pretty fascinating. Um I'm uh still kind of I'm working on my uh PhD, but I uh, withdrew until I'm gonna be reapplying next summer, just taking some time. Uh my um it's, my primary mentor is um uh, leading one of the SIGs of the um, ISSS, the International Society for the System Sciences. So we actually have a meeting this afternoon. And it turns out the woman who's been co-facilitating some of his events, she's actually the president-elect for ISSS for the 2023-2024. She's um, actually a professor at George Washington University here in DC, but has been on a three-year project uh, over in France, but that it's ending at the end of the year. So <laughs> a lot of intri intriguing pieces there because I'm I might not sure if I'm customer too, but I've been using the brain since night meeting Harlan back in 1998. So um, seeing how how that um, ties in and kind of just going back to basis. I'm, mentioned it a couple times before with, um, there's this um, well the latest piece of it is um, 
it's the Zettelkasten method. I think Michael was talking about that some too, but it's it I've seen it framed as the um, like GTD for writing and stuff. So that's um that's a big issue for me because I've been I've got so much writing to do and it's just been so overwhelming. So how can you break it down into small pieces and then construct stuff so that it looks like this is like the perfect approach and the brain can take take it to a whole nother level so it's what's going on for me what what's the kind of writing that you're working on what, what uh, are you thinking yeah um well um dissertation is the core core um thing but just yeah i have lots of ideas for for writing in fact yeah i came up with sed somebody else's dissertation <laughs> Doug will be happy to know. It's like when I know it's out of out of scope <laughs> and things. Um, yeah, it's really amazing. The German soci um, sociology professor that is known for really um, taking the method to a whole nother level and stuff. He, I think, in like thirty years, he wrote sixty textbooks and published over four hundred art scholarly articles and stuff so it is all basically it was um like a card catalog system but then he had a way of of organizing the cards and re reorganizing and um so like a whole linking strategy type of thing so it's um really intriguing and it's kind of i feel like it's kind of been a missing piece for me so, and i can see it again now too i got my I had to have cataract surgery back in August. So finally got my glasses for distance. I got them optimized to see um, um, close up. So reading and being on the computer, I don't need glasses at all, but it's <laughs> been a struggle until not having the distance too, so. Wow, congratulations, and, seeing is good. Well, and, uh, well, working at General Services Administration, I mean, we're at the core core of everything, really. I mean, so many were um, just one of the things that's fascinating is I was I attended. We have the public building service. We manage all the federal properties and stuff. And there's a whole landscaping horticulture group. And it's like there's they've gone through and there's like the species of bees that are indigenous to a region. And then there's like what there's like the whole planting strategy to like a whole pollinator um, strategy or whatever. And it's really fascinating. I mean, I didn't realize how much like specific species of bees have have like the symbiotic relationship with you know, species of flowers and they the flowers kind of they kind of tend to bloom. And they're actually kind of coordinating their blooming schedule so that to attract i mean it's just <laughs> fascinating stuff but i mean <laughs> you know and of course green buildings stuff so um all of you know and so we really help we're helping so many other agencies um provide their services and things so it's that's been making the dissertation challenging too because almost any social justice issue I'm interested in, GSA plays a critical role in, with, for the federal government's implementation of things. So it's like, that's where I've been trying to carve out that little, my, my niche of how I can contribute and stuff. So, and so that's where I'm at. Awesome. And, uh, that's perfect because now we're going to have Klaus and I'm sure he'll have something to say about bees. <laughs> In fact, that's what I wanted to start with. I love that you have bees and flower analogy because nature is based on relationships. You know? and, uh, and, and we don't appreciate and understand these complex relationships that are playing out in nature. I mean, we've talked about mushrooms, for example, you know, and trees communicating across uh, underground networks and which we are disrupting because we take the oldest tree out, which embeds all of the wisdom and you know, the defenses. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really uh, 
uh, yeah, we have done we have done some crazy stuff with nature. That's for sure. That's playing out right now. Yeah. So I've been <clears throat> trying to get a conversation going, and and Stacy and Eric have have uh, you know, participated just to 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 try to figure out how do you uh, how do you relate with people who don't have the time, inclination, um, you know, uh, whatever capacity resources to dial into complex issues related to climate change. You know, and in particular, as it relates to the food supply. So, I mean, I'm, I'm and I'm, I keep saying this, and that, you know, food and agriculture is completely at the same level of importance as is the energy sector. You know, you can't fix uh, uh, climate change and adaptation and mitigation without addressing food and agriculture, because we were doing so much damage in the natural world, which is now, you now playing out. We have decarbonized the soil, now we're taking trees out. We're overfishing the oceans in a dramatic way without any understanding of the implications, what that really means, because we have now global impact. I just saw yesterday that China is fishing out the Galapo Island region there. I mean, they have hundreds of fishing boats out there and pull everything out you know, I mean, in the worst way with these mile long track nets. So, so, and I've been not successful, I don't think at all. I mean, uh, trying to get some, some format going, and I hate to say the word structure because obviously that's the wrong approach. Um, but but to how do you talk you know, to a housewife um, who has you know, a couple of kids and is stressed out all day long? And how do you explain stuff to her so that a housewife will change, will, will understand, you know, the, and, and adapt um, her, her her buying behavior, her consumption behavior, you know, in ways that is contributing to this collective shift that we have to make. Now, uh, towards local sourcing, buying food from farmers who who grow regeneratively, and so on and so on, and and uh, so I'll I'll I'll, you know, I'll try again uh, to see if we can we can open this conversation up in ways that is more constructive and really looking for for input, and then I'm, I'm probably. Would be better to not be the moderator of the conversation. <laughs> Maybe I just should be the contributor, you know. Um, but I think it is so important right now to give people uh, tools to to uh, to um, have some autonomy um, in helping out, you know, in 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 assisting, you know, this adaptation. I mean, right now when you look at what is happening in Florida, my God, you know, I mean, this year has been catastrophic on a global level. Yeah. And you think the Yangtze River in China running dry, the Rhine River, they, they, yeah, on the Rhine River, I saw a picture a couple of weeks ago uh, where the Rhine River has dropped so low that it exposed a stone, right? And in that stone was carved, it was carved in 1600 something. And it said, if you see me, go home and weep. <laughs> you know, because it meant that, but if you see me, that means the water level is so low you will have crop failures, you know, you will suffer. And and so that's, it's global, right? I mean, it's, uh, this storm right now is going over central Florida regions where it wipes out all the crops that are still standing. Now, and we had the same cancers. I mean, you go California is out of order. So we, we, we have, we are looking at, um, we're looking at 2023, with massive disruptions, I mean, and we, we don't process this yet, but crop, global crop failures, and then on top of it, the war between Russia and the Ukraine. I mean, between Russia and Ukraine, one third of global cranes are coming from that region now. So, so countries like Lebanon and Yemen and you know, poor Egypt, you know, um, will find it very difficult to 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 supply their populations with basic food. Uh, so the Europeans are, you know, of course, are at huge risk because they're at risk of massive immigration attempts. I mean, the, the, the reason why Italy is moving right is because they have been overwhelmed with, with immigration from Africa. 
and they're basically saying enough we can't do this right it's destroying our culture and so on so so how do you talk to um different uh you know groups of people and say you know what uh you can help by maybe have a meatless monday you know or focus on uh a more a, a, a vegetable forward, you know, plant forward kind of food of dining, support your local farmer, you know, engage, uh, uh, or support businesses that are dialing into this. So that's that's uh, uh, getting getting these messages structured in ways that you have easy talking points is what I'm what I'm trying to 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 do. You know? And it's more complicated than I thought it would be. It's interesting. I, I just spent a week or a couple of days with uh, Diana Finch from the Bristol Pay in Bristol. And she was talking about how all these uh, programs will focus on the on the lower class people and helping them out. And, you know, it always looks good. We're going to help out these people who are dealing with, you know, difficult problems and community centers. And she said, but that's not the problem. The problem is the people in the nice neighborhoods are using a lot of electricity and buying these foreign foods and you know but you can never get funding for that what are you going around helping rich people they don't need your help and so it's very interesting what you're also referring to is like it's it's sometimes starting with the strong communities is what makes sense but we don't look there and then it's like oh well why should i care even in my own life i'm looking at it and i've decided to reduce my um my use of heating by half this year and it's very visceral for me because I use wood and so I know how much I ordered and that, that's it and um <clears throat> but why should I I could afford it you know so it's one of those things that it, those are the people that it's and I traveled by train throughout Europe and I flew back but but I traveled all the way from here to Berlin to London and boy it's really expensive and takes a long time but i know that that's what makes a difference it's not the people who are poor who are consuming everything you know it's it's the people who've got more who can consume more who this education also needs to get to all right so we've got stacy doug and then gil stacy yeah so i had originally put in the chat that i would pass but I'll just say real quickly that um, Thomas Ubel has been running a collective trauma uh, webinar. And one of the um, talks that I listened to was Stephen Forges on polyvagal theory, which I didn't know anything about. And I found it really interesting. I'm going to go further into that because it, um, it really gave the scientific background to the things that I've grown to know intuitively when it comes to using music and humor and things like that. But this actually does tie in to what Grace just said in response to Klaus, because, you know, I've been thinking we are always, we're, we're not targeting the people. Well, I was, I was thinking of in two, two separate ways. <laughs> For one, in terms of people that have the power to make decisions, they're the people that, and I don't just mean um, in turn, I'm not talking about food, I'm talking about, you know, people in power with great material wealth, they're the ones that have the most to lose. And so they're already in a defensive stance. And it just seems so often we're trying to unite to like fight against them. And it just seems almost counterintuitive. But when you think about worrying about how to help them, that also makes people feel prickly. Like, why are we worried about you know why are we worried about the oil companies they're horrible um and you know on the other side like what grace was saying you know for for me you know in an affluent community just hearing all this you know you know gloom and doom people don't want to hear that we're in our nice air-conditioned homes eating at our fancy restaurants most people don't want to hear things are going to change. So I don't know, there's a lot in there that's just been playing around in my mind. So I have nothing more to share, <laughs> but that's what I've been thinking about. But class, I am looking forward to Tuesday because there are a lot of things that I want to share there. 
Thank you, Grace. And um, look, yeah, help. I need help, obviously. But, but there is, you know, I am I am cautiously optimistic, right? Because the food system has the capacity to decentralize and, and things that Kevin is working on, for example, um, you can develop a cottage industry, you know, where people can can uh, uh, rent uh, a commercial kitchen. USDA approved and everything and cook meals, you know, for low income folks, instead of going to Walmart buying some processed crap, right? Uh, you can you for the same money, uh, or for, for much less money, you can cook uh, uh, a simple meal and feed people with with healthy uh, nutri nut nutritional foods, right? Um, I mean, a McDonald's meal, for example, is you know, eight, ten dollars or whatever. For that money, you can make you know, a stew. Uh, you can you can do. There's a lot of simple recipes using uh, uh, legumes, for example, you know, that we are all familiar with, with minimal amounts of protein, because you don't need as much protein as we as we normally eat, as we now eat. So so there, there are ways for for communities to secure themselves. And, and find employment you know, within instead of, I mean, this, the, the federal government is spending hundreds of billions of dollars on nutritional assistance programs, the SNAP program. 76% of the farm bill is for nutritional assistance programs. But most all of that money is being, being mopped up by Walmart, by Kroger, you know, the big companies. So, it, so you have that money go into a community and it goes whoop, whoop, right back out, right? Whereas if you develop a cottage industry in the community, then that money that the government puts in starts rolling, right? Because now that money turns because you have local people, you know, serving local people and bringing money that stays in the community and rolls several times. So that's the the, the opportunity that is so exciting, but you, <clears throat> you have to work your way through a massive regulatory hurdle at, at any level of government. <clears throat> if I could just add real quick, and I don't know if I mentioned it here, but um, there were like vouchers given out, and I think it was to support our farmers market, but it might have been to support the elderly community. I'm not sure, but what I do know is that they never made it to anyone. You know, and I called the local agencies and they were like, oh, you know, there's a backlog. But bottom line is they didn't make it to anybody. And that money supposedly is sitting somewhere. Um, the other thing I want to say is don't, you know, like when you said like meatless Mondays, things like that, those little things mean a lot. I remember, you know, we were having vegan nights. Now I'm not vegan, but on that night I was. And there's something about feeling like you're part of something. And again, those little changes sort of get into your head, you know, and my friends and I were looking for new vegan recipes. I think anything that makes you feel like you're doing it together is a positive step. Yeah. Yeah, and again, with the Bristol Pound, uh, uh, Diana, who, who she, she's retiring from that like they it didn't work having just a local currency because only the people who were um kind of already bought into buying local would use this local currency and they were trying to like make it sound really good and it, all it sounded like was a bunch of hippy dippy rich people are using it and, and it was a big pain in the butt for the um for the shop for the shops because they had to have another system next to their pos system next to their cash system it's like this whole big thing but what she's been developing and if you want to have her into your little conversation klaus is she's and she hasn't gotten it funded but she's put together at least the basic ideas behind it's kind of um, a community search like little badges you know like you get for brownie points or whatever and the idea is that the community determines in some ways what it is they want so they have one thing that's like the one meter club where you dig up a meter of your patio and just let it grow or um, points for um, buying the local CSA. And I, I used it all up. I figured out what to do with radishes in the winter, you know, like little points. And I rode my bicycle to work and all of these points that some of the local NGOs would like issue the certificate or you would self declare it. 
and the community could um, decide for themselves which certificates they want to honor. And would it mean anything? No, but it's like you were saying, Stacy. like, I feel like I belong because all my friends have, you know, rode their bike to work. Oh, you only rode your bike three times? I rode my bike four times. And so they were creating these kinds of, um, like she has a whole model for it. So if you wanted to have her in to talk about that, I'm sure she'd be glad to talk about. And it was all around um, community cohesion and sustainability and how do we create these as community projects. And she's also had a lot of ideas, which she of course comes up against regulatory and landlords and whatever. What if we took all the people who lived in this neighborhood and instead of having all of our separate boilers, we've got one hot water heater for the whole neighborhood and they live in um, the, the particular neighborhood she lives in, it's 72 units that are owned by this I don't know this the English have this weird thing so you own a 99 year like rights to stay there kind of lease thing it's kind of like and then they own the land and any improvements and so she was trying to propose this to them like we could improve your land and reduce the energy costs by doing this and they were like well if you um do a whole pricing for it then maybe we'll give you permission to do this crazy project on our land but it wasn't they didn't see it as an improvement of their housing units so but there are those kinds of like I said she's worked out a lot of these different ideas on how to bring communities together and what really works and that might be something that can help you guys it's not monetary incentive but it's something like you were saying any person could understand oh I get a little bit of a token and maybe the coffee shop gives me a little discount if I've got this much whatever ranking if I'm a black belt at ecology or I don't know so, Has she done it or is it just concept? Right now it's a concept based on, um, I think she may have run some little experiments, but it's a concept based on the failure of the current system that she's been running for four years. Oh. Yeah, I'd love to talk to her. That sounds interesting. Yeah, if you can share her contact. Okay, I'll introduce you. And, and she, they're also um, ending the project at the end of it's 10 years and it didn't succeed and they're ending it and she'll be looking for work. So she's happy to uh, get her feelers out and talk to other people about the work that she's done and teach and stuff like that. So Cool. Um, okay, so I think we've got Doug now. Um, so I'm sort of preoccupied with <clears throat> the fundamental the fundamental idea of how do we do us different and better um, as a species. <laughs> um, and getting, getting free and clear and out of the prevailing paradigm and frame and orientation. So coming at that question from a really blank slate kind of place. Um, and um, you know, most of my time in the last 10 years has been doing field work, like how do we talk to each other? Like what's step one in human beings co-creating together? Like what's the first thing? Since most, thing, most initiatives seem to start at chapter four or five and then rattle apart because the foundation wasn't laid. Um, so um, in Kevin's share, where I go is like, you know, what was the foundation for everybody getting busy? And, um, and I, I'm also an attorney and I'm working with Kim Wright on integral law, which really doesn't have anything to do with law. It has to do with what's the replacement for the current legal system. Like what's the new that need is needed. Um, and I'm finding, and, and I'm working with an array of other people that are coming at different pieces of the elephant with the same ask, like what's needed and what's, what's the new, like, how do we replace all this stuff? Um, that doesn't really serve needs like the source of it all was um, driven by ownership competition scarcity fear control power so um 
that's pretty much my work. And, and figuring out how to crack the nut, Klaus, your thing about, you know, how do I get this across or how do I um, land and register? How do I make this, energize this for a housewife, for, for somebody who's in the middle of the existing paradigm with no, no sort of connection or awareness or openness um, beyond individual daily life meeting needs and keeping up with the Joneses and the, the prevailing paradigm and orientation. And um, a lot of where I'm, I've gotten to uh, and, and find myself focusing in on more and more is um, if people are not in feeling, they're not open and in learning. Like they're not susceptible to new. Um, and so, you know, that water dimension, that emotional dimension is, is a critical piece of the puzzle. And um, all of the preoccupation with knowledge and with data and with facts and with solutions and with all of that stuff, which is all, you know, up in air and mental body dimension um, is sort of for naught if um, the awakening and opening up to that's, that's sort of needed on a really massive level um, isn't catalyzed somehow first. So um, how to create a safe container for people to sort of come back to life, reawaken. Um, how to catalyze that without any English or agenda, without um, it being power, playing power control authority over, even if in very subtle form, like not coming with where you want them to end up, but coming with um, empowering them reconnecting with power, in their own power, their own voice, their own creativity, their own uh, entitlement as, as card-carrying members of the human race. Um, like those fundamental levels are where I'm sort of focused. Um, and with virality technology and its ability to trigger massive, unbelievably fast propagation and, and catalyzing of movements, awakenings, trends, you know, whatever, even if in superficial cultural pop culture frames, right? Like how many, how, how long did it take for everybody to start putting buckets over their head? Um, like figuring out how to employ the tools and resources in service to that awakening from a catalyzing place without agenda and projection um, is sort of my preoccupation. Sorry for the length of that, but with that, I'm done. Well, I'm curious about the legal frameworks, like how do you think about cross-border things? Is that one of the things that's coming up? Because, you know, one of the things that we're <laughs> seeing is like this, it's like we're in these legal frameworks that are geographically bound that don't make any sense. Well, the, the antecedent roots of all those borders were the few projecting maps that met their interests and, and compromises relative to each other in power control authority over. None of that was in service to people. <laughs> it was in service to minerals. It was in service to wealth. It was in service to control. Um, and uh, part of the sort of fundamental consciousness awakening and shift in orientation is um, 
taking things that are inconceivably institutionalized and imprinted out of the equation. So like, where did ownership come from? And why is that a, 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 a cornerstone principle of everything? And if you take ownership out, what happens? You know, and, and it's not a complete blank slate mystery because indigenous folks don't, don't own anything they're part of, they're integrated with. Uh, it never occurred to them to like project ownership over anything. So um, I have given voice to that in very straight, legitimate, professional contexts, like take ownership out. You know, I had a friend who had a company and he was, he had decided to, to st he started playing with appreciation tokens and he ended up going to, I wanna literally transform the whole company into a token-based um, model. And, um, and he said, I got a problem because I want John and Jakey Public to be able to you know, engage with the company and participate and contribute. But in order to do that, I run into securities laws. I've got to, I got to go public. And 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 I looked at him and I said, um, "What if you take ownership out? What if you don't have ownership? If you eliminate ownership, which is a." symbol or stock represents a piece of ownership of a thing, a res, a piece of property. That's about deriving value from the fact of owning it. If you take that out, but you look at the other facets, which is um, decision-making, right? And sort of control authority expressions or decision-making around directions, that can be handled separate from ownership. If you want to, if you look at it as participation in profits and losses or appreciation and value of the whole, well, that actually can be handled contractually. Doesn't require ownership. It's about the agreement and consensus of the whole. So <clears throat> it is possible to extrapolate. And I said, if you take ownership out, you eliminate the concept of securities <laughs> representing ownership, then the securities laws don't apply. You're no longer in regulated territory. It's the agreements by and between the people. You don't have public offering. You don't have any of that crap. You have a living organism <laughs> with agreements covering different facets of its flow, its value flows, its decision flows, its generative flows. Like, why not? Don't invite ownership to the party, take it out. So like, are there ways, are there orientational, you know, shifts that enable a completely different way of relating to what's needed, responding to actually what's needed in service to the people that are doing what they're doing. Um, and everything changes. So I, I took the other pill, I'm out of the matrix. The clock doesn't govern. I don't provide services on a quid pro quo exchange basis, transactional basis. My needs get met through a completely different thought process and orientation. And my value contributions, my value contribution, if I can help, call. <laughs> and, you know, so it's like all sorts of things reorder when you get out from under. So two, two, two <laughs> quick questions. I, one is the same one Gil asked is what about perpetual trusts? But the second is I would love to see a, a, you know, a, a TikTok, a day by day of you and your economic exchanges or resource exchanges and what it looks like. You know, here's the old Doug, here's the new Doug. 
I would really love to see. I, I think I buy into what you're sort of saying, but I sure would love to see it. Well, well, first of all, it's still a work in pro in process. Yeah, sure. Of course it is. Um, but I I sort of made the decision to decouple from transaction in in terms of uh, providing value to others as in a value ecosystem frame, um, severed from how does value flow to me to meet needs? Because like you got to meet needs and fiat currency is part of that. And like that has to be handled and, and approached. And so, I'm not I'm I'm not buying any Learjets any day anytime soon. But like, is there enough flow back um, based on appreciation, based on interest in supporting um, my commitment to doing it differently? Um, <laughs> Like, you know, kludging that together is, has been, you know, an adventure. Is it, you know, is there abundance of fiat currency? No, um, but I'm still playing with it. Like I'm playing with how to do that. Um, and, and what's come out of that focus on that is, is I'm starting to zero in on what's the narrative? What's the the story and the framing around that piece that reflects a shifting of the orientation of the people that want to flow value to me if they choose. Um, so I'm like really into the weeds with that right now, um, but happy to share. <laughs> yeah, I'm I've, sure I've tried, so I've tried a bunch <clears throat> of interesting things and I'm, you know, there are some emergent things that like have got me tickled, but that are really, you know, event horizon territory. But um, it's that it comes down to like, there's some narrative around what's the new, what's the orientation, framing and setting that stage, contextualizing it. Um, so anyway. You know, there was this guy, Magic Sam, who used to advertise on Soul Train. Uh, and uh, he would he would get plastic footprints, and then he would give you instructions on where to put the footprints. Um, I would love to have that from what you're doing, you know? <laughs> Magic Sam version. Uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't, I'm not solid enough yet to be able to generate that, but I'm getting closer. I'm getting hmm. closer. Doug, the narrative is already compelling, but uh, while you're working on Kevin's TikTok and plastic footprints, could you just give us like a tiny snapshot of um, how how you obtain food and shelter in it, within this scheme? Just like make you know, dog shit practical. Give me one example because I, I, I love where you're going, but I, I'm not grasping it yet. Well, what the it was a series of sort of committing to not covering that the old way. Like the first was to say, not that. And then um, literally it took two years to figure out what's on me to enable value to flow, to get to me, for money to get to me. And so I had to set up the means for somebody to send me cash. That's a two years. I, I know that might sound insane to all of you, but like um, my response, you know, my end of it required me to say, you know, here's a PayPal this, or here's a, you know, bank wire stuff there, or here's another channel or means here. Um, that's on me. Let me let me let me shift the question a little bit. The, okay. the the mechanisms for movement of 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 currency is clear. I've got my PayPal. I've got my fiat. What's the conversation you're having with the people that you're engaged with that that invites the flow in the way that you're talking about? Well, it, it, the 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 share is basically um, it's in the context of somebody comes looking for help or somebody yep. comes looking for legal or whatever. And, and I, and I share that um, I do not do that 
mm -hmm. in a transactional frame. Mm -hmm. um, I do need to live and I do appreciate it when people support me and, and contribute to me. So it's, it's shifted more into that frame. But the providing of the service, the providing of the help, the providing of whatever is needed that's in my wheelhouse is not linked to a quid pro quo. So are you, are you talking about gift economy, basically? Well, the gift economy construct is a little bit different mm -hmm. because um, there's a, and, and, and I'm, we're really in shadow land here, so bear with me. <laughs> Um, it's offering the person sitting across the table the moment to think about what it means to them in the context of, okay, I'm not paying you. I want your help, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not paying you. But I would like to do something. And in that context, I've tried different things. Mm -hmm. It's the old story about, you know, the church donation box mm -hmm. and the one that's just on the wall outside the church door with nothing is empty. And the one that's on the wall outside the door, and there's a little sign that says, you know, suggested donation, $5. In that people very often need or would like help or information for me to calibrate, right? To have a way of orienting to, if I wanted to donate something, what would I donate? What would I want to give you? Well, so so, that's, so that's, that's one dimension. There's another dimension that's, you know, well, why, why are you doing this? And sharing where I'm coming from, which is I really want to like, whole cloth i want to figure out a new way of relating to that side of it and how i meet my needs and and then buying into that just the exercise and concept of that and going you know what here i'm going to send you x dollars a month and um i'm sort of multiplying variations on those themes um not from an orientation of dark arts in you know manipulation coercion incentivization inducement right uh for them to send me money out of you know guilt or out of obligation or out of any of that stuff but literally i realized sort of an extension of my job is to give people a way of orienting how they want to do that if they're moved to do it mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so so I've, I, I've drunk my own Kool-Aid in terms yeah, of yeah. not using the old, um, any aspect of the old in, in how I have to solve this. So anyway. So su suggested price, su suggested donation sounds sort of like price, but not exactly, but sort of like. What this echoes for me, kind of my favorite story about this was a guy I knew years ago who was an ag advisor. Uh, in the Fresno area. And these are the folks who advise farmers about what to do and how to grow and how to plant. And typically um, they make most of their money from selling pesticides. So it's, you know, it's like the mm -hmm. conflict of interest of the pharmacist <clears throat> making all the drugs they dispense to you. It's like, you know, crazy scheme. He, he invented something differently. He said to the farmers, I will work with you for the season. At the end of the season, you pay me what I was worth. No questions asked. Um, and he claimed that he averaged about double the revenue <laughs> per acre that the pesticide hawkers were making. Hmm. Uh, and it's clearly a trust relationship, uh, which seems an important part of what you're talking about. This would be hard to do on a street corner in the middle of New York City with strangers, maybe, or maybe not, actually. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I look forward to hearing more about this with you. Yeah. And, yeah. and by the way, I've heard of, 
open invitation to all of you. I'm, you know, freestyling here. I am open and interested. And, you know, anybody that has a take or an idea or an insight that is in alignment, right, doesn't involve resorting to old paradigm, old tricks, but, you know, would be something to think about or talk about or explore. I'm like, please, you know, yeah. reach out. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. And I, you and I need to reschedule. So we'll do that. I've, I've obviously worked a lot with those types of things because of the workshop I did. And when I did the workshop, I haven't done it in a long time. I, I'll probably go back to it pretty soon. Um, and so there'll be a, another cohort y'all can join, but it's always pay what feels right to you. There's a suggested price so that you have like an orientation. There's price, there's two things. One is courses of this type are charged from this to this range. And then there's suggested global north price. And then there's pay what you want. And then when you sign up, you don't pay. When you sign up, you get a 15 minute interview with me that kind of makes people actually come to the course. Cause if you're not paying, you have this like free in your mind and right. it doesn't work. It's it, cause it's reverse classroom. And then around, around session four, I put people into groups of three and I say, okay, talk about how this is going for you. This not paying thing or pay what you want and some have paid by then some haven't and they have these discussions about like what it's worth what does that even mean and 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 it's good and and i ended up netting between five and twelve dollars an hour um myself and my co <laughs> like it wasn't it wasn't a, but it wasn't my main business right um another way that i've seen that done is people who will say okay what's your dream outcome and what's it worth to you if i get a hundred percent of that and then work with me and then whichever percentage of that you think you got pay me like you were saying like what it's you know what would and but at the beginning saying what is your dream outcome it also creates a really uh, useful frame that you know if you're going towards it or not so yeah michael you wanted to add something yeah i just i'm, I'm really struck by the um relationship between what we're talking about here and UBI and um, the the scaling of a group of people, you know, on up to everybody who are giving their skills and not having to worry about eating and having shelter, you know, just like it can be done a sort of a sort of group UBI can be done among people without involving government. Um, and, and, there, and there's also the, the, the notion of how that's distributed and um, people understanding, say in your case, Doug, the, the, the gifts, not meaning gift economy, but the, the services and skills that you have on offer and saying, I don't need that now, but I'm going to like spend this even or uneven amount per month in Doug's direction, knowing that when I need that, Doug's there for me. And then how, how can you scale that above, beyond to others? That, you know, that's definitely a facet in this, right? And, and I think there's also, um, when, you, when you separate, when you bifurcate the contributing from the, how do I meet my needs? It makes the needs piece stand on its own as a subject, as a, as a basis of inquiry, as an orientation. And it also, um makes the distinction between needs and wants really much more real right and you know my needs are you know probably around $1900 a month like i'm not living large it's not that expensive um and that could probably be lowered if i were you know, really focused on, on that. And, you know, um, and that's intrinsic to the, the orientational shift that needs to happen. Globally, 
because um, it's in the imbalance of the people, you know, the people that have taken everything out of balance with massively uh, gross accumulations of, of wealth at the expense of, because it's in a, it's in a closed system, right? So, you know, for somebody to be a trillionaire, it means there are a whole bunch of people starving. And um, if I, I sort of subscribe to the idea that like, if we're actually going to avert an extinction, it's all of us or none of us. And um, that means the haves are really going to have to sort of like make some adjustments. Um, so, so, sensitizing to you know what is a need and and to that idea of you know creating an ecosystem or community where the needs aren't it's not about like everybody get in doubt Dow, dowland and in these alternative you know experiments gets preoccupied with how to you know uh track or measure accrual of entitlement to token like you know, what is this person's contribution versus that person's contribution? And um, <clears throat> that is not an inquiry that has to do with what are those people's needs. Yeah. That's an inquiry of, you know, reducing people to transactional frames. And that's old paradigm. That's not going to do it. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what priceless is about, right? Like the priceless now. It's like you can't, and this whole thing about how do we, people always ask me, how do we incentivize? I'm like, no, no. How do you de incentivize <laughs> everything? De incentivize everything, let people give freely. Like, what would that look like? And I think that, I mean, if I were going to just sort of, we've talked about this topic, like it's come up, I want, I want to get to a couple more people, but this topic has kind of been underlying a number of the conversations that we've been having here. Um, you know, everything from food, you know, when, like I said, when the pandemic hit, the first thing that people did in Slovenia was plant a garden, right? And it's like, <laughs> the one underlying theme, I think, is how can you use less money? How can you be more locally resourced? And, and, and everything from eating your food locally and buying your food locally, maybe it's not cheaper right now, but it's using less of the world's resources. And, and, and I think that's sort of something we can all do. And I've been playing with a lot and it sounds like you've been playing with a lot. And, and those are, those are real questions. I and mean, it's one of the reasons I left the U S in 1990, I just said, these people, they don't understand the difference between what they need and what they want. Like matching hand towels and soaps <laughs> before you invite a guest isn't a need, but you kind of feel like you need that. Otherwise what's the guest going to think of, you know, Anyway, um, Gil is next, and then maybe we'll get to some of the people who showed up late. I, I guess I'll go with Gil, and then if anybody um, of the people who arrived at the top of the hour, maybe whoever feels like they really uh, want to add something, that'd be great. So, Gil? Uh, if you're going to say something, you'll have to unmute, and if not, we can call on whoever feels called. Neither Gil nor his fathom note taker are saying anything. Klaus <laughs> wants to say something, but we have we have four people who joined who haven't said anything yet. And John is clapping. Is that is that clapping a hand raise? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, that Go was ahead, a, John. That, that was a hand raise. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to point out the the article I just posted here. Uh, USDA opens people gardens initiative to gardens nationwide. I mean, there already is an understanding, deep understanding on the government side, you know, that we will have to revitalize the, uh, what what was this initiative called during World War II? Uh, uh, Victory Gardens. Victory Gardens, right? So here it is. It's already, it's already on the radar. It's already being, being uh, promoted and pushed forward now because this is exactly where we're going. Yeah, great. John, then Mike. Okay, just a, a quick question, and, and, and you know, fine. If you've already done this, it's fine. But it strikes me. First of all, I, I can really appreciate 
Grace a decision to say, wait a minute, this is all wrong. And I need to, you know, really get a blank slate in terms of how people think about things. And I appreciate Doug's awareness of the difference between transactional uh, kinds of connections with people and and more relational. And it's, it's beyond gift economy, but that's a step in that direction. As a transitional uh, process, I've, I've been trying to imagine uh, different futures in which the present is breaking down, but it hasn't fully collapsed. And, and people are trying to grow something else. And in versions of that, I have a you know, a kind of a green crypto, which is uh, asset backed and you can only, you know, it's, 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 it has anti-accumulation stuff built in. Uh, there's all, everybody knows how to do this. I mean, the people who work with crypto know how to do it. And, um, but, but the reason why you put that in place is you'd kind of have this bifurcation. You, you, you're, you're not going to completely get rid of the fiat. You're not going to get completely get rid of the whole thing. I mean, it's just, it's just too massive a, a change unless unless we have mass death or something you know which and then that then the change might might happen but i don't want to get that i don't want to get there that way i can imagine a system in which there's there's ubi defined as uh basic needs not not with a rough income figure but more like look food shelter water you know that's it everybody's entitled to that it's not transactional you know, you don't have to ask for it. You don't. Have to, it's not like you know, come and beg, and then we'll give it to you. No, 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 no. That's that's basic. Everybody gets that. And then there's elements of this other system that are still around, and people are still playing with the other system. But the the two systems are, are kind of coexisting and uh, competing for a while. And it it seems I, it's very hard to design that, but I, it <clears> seems <throat> kind of realistic in terms of if I'm imagining partial collapse and and partial evolution of the alternative. Uh, eco village kind of thing coming up. So I just want to put that out. It's it's not a not a statement as much as a question. Is what are the versions of that that are possible and and uh, you know can we do can we do useful work in thinking thinking through that? That's it. Yeah, I would really love to do useful. I've done a lot of work on that, and I've got three different models we want to try out, and I have no idea how to get funding for it. But yeah, I think that's exactly the space we're in. And we do have things like ClimateDAO and other kinds of things that are trying to do that. But I think we are exactly in that world. Like there is this transition going on, and yeah. But right now, the most likely way the transition will happen is not in a planned way. Mike. Uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, sorry, I couldn't join earlier. I had a call I was chairing. Um, has anybody joined Unfinished? I, I'm hoping to watch Jerry tomorrow morning, um, even if it's 4 a.m. our time. <laughs> but if you haven't, I mean, it's, it, I hope they tape it. Uh, and also, I wanted to make sure people saw that Ken Homer had done an interview with Jerry. And that looked, uh, that's something worth sharing. Okay, good. And just to do a little self-promotion, tomorrow at nine o'clock, uh, Carnegie is doing a discussion on data policy, particularly focusing on Korea and India. But uh, I'm chairing that. It's a report that we pulled together and released last month. Um, one expert from Korea, one from India, and then some people from France and New York to to really talk about, you know, how do we get people to share data, which then ties in the last comment to uh, your conversation about getting people to do things uh, freeware style. Um, so much of the data the entire economy runs on is being maintained sort of as a labor for love. And a lot of the software, more and more of the software is turning out to have just a little component here and there that, you know, is nonprofit and uh, nobody's there supporting it, which can lead to some real problems. So I, I would love to have any help that any of you could provide on the, the software problem. You know, how are we going to maintain or, or improve the software that the digital transformation is being built upon? So just a challenge, just a little topic. Um, but that's something I'm worried about these days. Thanks for a good conversation. Yeah, thanks. And please um, post the um, link to the yeah. thing at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. I'm definitely interested. And uh, again, uh, I can't believe I have to post links and I have to be both Jerry and Pete. 
It's like, <laughs> that's way too much. It's not fair. <laughs> All right. Doug Carmichael. Hi. Uh, I probably need it. No, I'm not. Uh, I've been working on a pro project that fits in here to some degree. And that is in uh, the problems in Pakistan. The government is looking at rebuilding the infrastructure so they can recover the economy. An alternative approach is that all the people who got flooded out know how to make shacks. They know how to grip, plant uh, little plots of food that might survive only for a few seasons, but they know how to do it. Supporting people with those skills would be a different approach to the redevelopment of Pakistan. And it would be a model to the world because I think the way those people live submerged now is the way we're all going to be living in the future. Thank you. And I'm going to call on Julian to wrap up because he's the only person who hasn't spoken and we're at the end, but uh, it's just, you know, let's have everybody say at least a few words, Julian. Or not, maybe we'll just look at his beautiful landscape. Does anybody else want to say a few words just to wrap up? All right, I will say a few words to wrap up. Um, thanks everybody for being on this OGM call and uh, for letting me host it. It's been uh, fun to be able to be the person who interjects my wisdom and arrogance in everybody's uh, comments. So that's great. I, I like doing that. It makes me feel important. And uh, and thanks for a really deep conversation about you know what value is and how do we really make this transition real. I think that's um, we're seeing more and more of that these days. People moving from talking about the problem to taking actions, little actions, big actions, um, and I'm really gratified to see that that's also the direction that this group has taken from just being a coffee shop where we talk about things where we actually share what we're doing and try to spread the doingness as well. So thank you, everybody. Nice work, Grace. It was a great one. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>